right, so last session, I'm going to try to bring the energy up, end on an energetic note, if not a high note. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about DevSec defense. I'm going to looking at some DevSec principles that we as defenders can use uh, when we're going about developing detections as well as kind of the full life cycle um, of developing, tuning, maintaining detections. So uh, I work for uh, Mandiant FireEye. I started doing instant response um, on the Mandiant consulting side and then moved into an applied research position, basically doing detection stuff all day long. Um, I, uh, I like writing obfuscation stuff. Um, here's a couple of the projects that I've worked on. Uh, Cradle Crafter was actually released here last year. Um, and then I also uh, really like writing detection stuff, um, which is the reason I do obfuscation, which we'll look at in this talk. So my motivation for this, um, we're really going to kind of do a deep dive on three uh, case studies, and we're going to kind of walk through my methodology as a defender. I'm um, looking at some of the tool sets and some of the frameworks that I use um, to, to kind of automate some of the process around detection development and kind of enumerating problem spaces so that I can be developing more resilient detections. So uh, I started out in IT operations, um, then I moved into security. As I said, I then moved into consulting, um, and then now I'm in kind of applied research and development at scale for all of the, um, the product suite that we have at FireEye and all the tools that we use as mandate consultants. But there have been two things that have remained consistent across all of these changes. One is very, very high quality coffee. I'm a huge coffee snob. And the other one is an aspiring PowerShell aficionado. Now, why do I say this? Well. Attackers love PowerShell as well. And this is kind of what got me started into detection work, um, is seeing this tool that I'd used for, uh, for, I would say, legitimate purposes for operationalizing tasks. And now I see attackers using it. And I really got curious, how can I better detect this? And there's a ton of offensive tradecraft available for attackers for free. Um, and a lot of times you'll see, uh, in a, a ton of our investigations, we'll see attackers just doing really simple one-liner remote download cradles. Um, this would only work on PowerShell 3 for this IWR's invoke web, web request. But typically, you'd see attackers do something more like this and stay PowerShell 2.0 compliant. So when I started to see this, I said, OK, what are the artifacts? What are the behaviors? What are the heuristics I can use to start to detect this kind of malicious activity? And a, a big distinction I want to make is rigid signatures versus resilient detections. And there's a very, very big difference. Um, one is, is very reactive. It's saying, I saw this thing. And there's a time and a place for that. Um, I saw this thing. I want to detect just this thing. And we have a very focused. IOC or Yara rule or snort signature for this one thing. Maybe it's a family, maybe it's a tool. Um, but then we should also step back and say, well, might the attacker ever change something about this? How can we take a step back with a second detection and say, how can we detect this categorically or from a methodology perspective? And as attacker TTPs change, so should our detections kind of. Some detections maybe don't need to change because they're resilient enough, they're broad enough, but others do. Um, just as in the last talk, we saw that K uh, Casey Smith or Sub T tweeting out something was being used by Fin7 within 24 hours. Like, we need to stay on top of this kind of stuff and say, OK, did this new technique that, that just became more broadly communicated, did it affect our existing detections? And if so, which ones? And do we need to modify an existing one or add a new one? Or is it covered under a larger umbrella of more methodology-based detections? So what is this talk? Is it about automation? DevSec is in the title, so are you some DevOps wizard? No. Um, is it about detection development? And the answer is kind of yes to all three of those. So we're going to look at three case studies. Um, I got more laughs out of this one than the only other time I've used this, this meme, so I'm glad that a couple people thought it was funny. Um, I, I, I got like, a lot of mixed results in the office when I asked, but I was like, I'm going to use it and see what happens. Um, so I want to talk about my methodology for crafting detections around each of these categories. And specifically, I'm going to kind of pull back the curtains on some of the tools that I've built, as well as tools that are publicly available, the kind of frameworks that I use to help me with this development process. So first, PowerShell obfuscation. Um, whenever, whenever I'm approaching a problem of detection, it's important to define what the problem is. How prevalent is it? What are the tools that we have at our disposal to detect this? And what tools might we, if we had, we'd do a better job of detecting? Sometimes we need to build tools if they don't exist. Um, and then, obviously, develop detections and go back and test and, and see, does this need to be tuned to make it more effective? 
So the problem is PowerShell argument and script obfuscation can evade a lot of rigid detections. So to, to kind of quickly show that, if we have an attacker, the remote download cradle, let's say we create a simple YAR rule looking for all these strings to be present, that would detect this command. But there's a lot of things that attackers can do, um, like concatenating strings, or PowerShell is very, um, is very compliant with uh, slashes. So when you have HTTP colon, you can actually have mismatched slashes, and it still works. Um, download string is, uh, if you actually tokenize a PowerShell command, this is called a member token. And so you can actually put single quotes around it and double quotes. And then if you have double quotes, you can put a tick mark in front of it. That's because the tick mark is the escape character for PowerShell. And if it's escaping something that is not 0, A, B, F, N, R, T, V, and I think in PowerShell 6 they introduced U um, as another character, if you escape something that's not one of those special characters, then it doesn't have any meaning at all. And the problem is it still appears in the arguments and the script block logs. So you can put a lot of tick marks in there, as long as you stay away from the A, B, F, and R, T, V, and 0. But if you really want to put ticks in front of those, all you have to do is uppercase it, and now ticks will work. There, unfortunately, is no uppercase 0, so that one still can't really do. But we can, as, a, as an attacker, we can really screw around with a lot of the data set that we as defenders rely on. So what if we wanted to treat this truly as a string? All we have to do is now encapsulate it with parentheses, and then we could just concatenate it like a string. Now, if you're using PowerShell 2, you're going to need to add a dot .invoke member, but PowerShell 3 or later totally doesn't need it. You can actually have white space in that uh, location. But we'll leave dot .invoke in there so it works, because attackers love PowerShell 2 because that's the kind of the lowest common denominator on all the systems that they might hit. So we can concatenate it. We can use the dash f format operator and start to reorder the string. Again, this is just taking download string. We could even go a step further and say, why don't we just have an array of ASCII character values and then convert it back in memory, and that's download string now. So how else can we produce a string download string? Like, like where did these ideas come from? So I thought it would be cool to kind of just walk through a, a demo of one of the ways I thought was, OK, well, what if I just say new object net that web client? It creates the object. What if I pipe it to get member? Tell me something about this object. There's tons of methods, and one of them happens to be download string. OK, that makes sense. That's what I want. Um, so let me actually filter down and get just that method name. So I'm going to say, hey, get this data, and just let me have the object where the name matches or like download string. Boom, there we go. And actually, I'm only interested in the name field. So let me go ahead and add parentheses.name. So we'll just return the string download string. Perfect. Now, how can we obfuscate this? Well, since like is like a, a match, a regular expression, we can use wildcards like that, and we still get download stream. OK. Um, I like and C like is case sensitive and case insensitive. Most people don't write detections for that. Dollar sign underscore is current variable, so we can do a lot of different things, like do a directory listing on a variable name of underscore, then add a dot value. Where object, we can replace this with a question mark if we want. Git member, you can just remove git dash from any PowerShell commandlet. It automatically interprets it as the correct name. You can also use gm, or you can do gal, which is the alias for git alias, and pipe gm, and then pipe that into an invocation operator, and now it's git member. Whew. All right, we're still going. For an argument, net.webclient, we can throw parentheses around it, and we can just concatenate it in line. It still works. And lastly, we'll go back to new object, which is a commandlet. And in this case, um, we'll just use the dash f format operator, and we're going to invoke it with a dot. You could also use an ampersand. Those are both invocation operators. So we're basically going to say, chop it into two substrings, and then re reverse the order of those two substrings to get it to work. Perfect. So this is download string now. So let's copy this, and let's create just a simple download cradle. Again, something an attacker might use. Let's just make sure that it works. And we're going to use the, uh, the bit.ly totally legit link. I should just print out a green statement. Perfect. Now let's go back and let's replace that download string. We'll just throw in our parentheses and then paste in our payload here, adjust for that new line, hit Enter, and our command works. So we can iterate like that. When I say we, I mean attackers can do that. So how does this affect my data as a defender? How does this affect my detections as a defender? So let's paste that in. This is now download string. And I'm kind of calling this member enumeration or like string substitution obfuscation. And we can keep going, add ticks there. Yeah, let's just keep going. New object, format operator, ASCII. In this case, we're using git command, new object with some wildcards, and then invoking that with a dot from the object that's returned. And 
invoke expression is the kind of the, the, the intelligible piece of what's left here, right? But there's a ton of ways that you can actually invoke code. So let's just, let's just take the whole body, the rest of the uh, command, and let's store it in this expression variable. And let's walk through some ways we can invoke the contents of that expression variable. So since it's a command that we can use tick marks, we can uh, invoke it with the invocation operator, and just I basically any way we can get IEX, right? Concatenation, reordering, uh, ASCII conversion. In this case, we're saying, let me take a string. In this case, it's an empty string. And let me see this member. Now, this member happens to be an overloaded member, so it will show us many members. Let me take that, cast all that text to a string, and then the 84th, 11th, and the 80th indexes are going to be I, E, and an X, and we're going to join that back together and invoke it. That is IEX. So as you can see, there's really no end. There's no limit. We're just manipulating strings and pulling the data from weird places. Um, we could also use git command or git alias, or their aliases themselves, and use wildcards there. Um, we can take expressions, cast them to script blocks, um, run spaces, invoke as a workflow. This is PowerShell 3 or later. We can also go to PowerShell 1 and use this execution context. This is an automatic variable in PowerShell, and there are tons of ways that you can execute code and do a lot of stuff. And I've still, I've still only seen like one or two attackers use this. And I bet you a lot of defenders aren't looking for execution context, which you should be. But if you are, attackers could just do that. And it's kind of like, ugh. Like, how do you deal with that, right? And this is using that substitution um, obfuscation. So basically, there's a lot of ways you can obfuscate any component of PowerShell. Um, with in, in Invoke Cradle Crafter, um, which I talked about last year, um, I basically built out this a huge uh, invocation list where you can go through and enumerate any of these options to kind of have um, each of these components randomized so you can basically say, as a defender, crap, do I detect this? Or what if I just generate 1,000 uh, payloads with all these options? How many of these would I detect based on invocation syntax? The important thing to note is that PowerShell logging is awesome. Module logs are not affected by this obfuscation, but script block logs are. So invoke obfuscation, invoke cradle crafter um, are uh, two, are the, the, the first two obfuscation frameworks that I wrote to make this kind of stuff easy. Um, and again, for me, I basically wrote these as like custom fuzzers kind of, so that if I know if I know something is able to be executed or moved around in a certain way, if I can build that logic into an automated tool, then I can generate thousands of examples that still execute properly and then write my detections off of that. So we input just a simple write host command, and we can go through each of the tokens and say obfuscate the strings, obfuscate the command, the members, et cetera. Or we can just obfuscate all of it together as many times as we want. And it will randomly go through and obfuscate all of those. Um, and at any point, you can go back and say, let me wrap all that in as a string layer obfuscation and treat the whole thing as a string. In this case, let's just reverse the whole command and concatenate it. And you can do that many times over and over again, and it still works. But hey, we're almost at 3,000 characters. Maybe we should compress it and save some space. That's a, a function I added a couple months ago. So we just chopped off 1,000 characters. Perfect. We'll grab it to the clipboard, copy it in PowerShell, and our testing one, two, three still works. So let's remove all that. Let's go to encoding. There's a ton of encoding here. The two ones I uh, released uh, last year are special character only, so 100% special characters. This was originally found by uh, a Japanese researcher back in 2010. Our payload still works. It's a really brilliant way that he, uh, he came up with that. And then this is white space encoding. So our entire command is white space in, uh, delimited by tabs, or tabs delimited by white space, and then decoded by a stub at the end. As you can see, it still works. Defenders in the house feeling pretty good? Yeah, all right. Rob's feeling good. So as a cradle crafter, you can basically just say, OK, well, let me take a completely different approach. Maybe I don't want tick marks and stuff in my command. Maybe I just want to feed a URL to that same bit.ly link and then kind of explore that uh, substitution obfuscation. So in this case, we'll just set our URL to that link. We can choose between memory or disk-based cradles. We'll just go to the, the kind of regular uh, download string option. Um, and we can basically uh, similarly choose between different token types um, and obfuscate that. And it kind of highlights it yellow so you can see the changes that happened. So now we're using git command and kind of showing it's producing different options there. Or we can use PowerShell 1.0 syntax, which again gets really crazy, really fast. Um, and as you can see, it, it downloaded the, uh, the code. It didn't actually invoke it because we didn't add an invocation syntax. But for that, this is what the screenshot was earlier. Here's the invocation menu. We'll just choose one of those, and that now is IEX. So again, it gets pretty crazy pretty fast. And as you can see, that command still works. But what you can do is you can just go to all and just run that as many times as you want and have it 
go through all the pieces and randomize all of those. But then, after testing to make sure it still works, you can put it in the clipboard, and then you can set it back into Invoke Obfuscation and say, I've used Cradle Crafter to get substitution obfuscation. Let me take it back into Invoke Obfuscation and do token layer obfuscation. Then let me go back, and it's going through randomly all the tokens that are there, which is a lot more than the original one. And then you can go back and add all that string layer, encoding layer, all that kind of stuff. And PowerShell script lock logs will log every unwrapped layer, except for the very last one, and all that obfuscation is still going to be present. So OK. Now that we know that attackers can do that with a few clicks of a button, um, why did you do that? Like, how do we detect this? Well, again, as defenders, let's assess our tools. What do we have? Well, Microsoft has given us awesome PowerShell logging, module, script lock, transcription logs. Um, but you have to know some of the limitations there in terms of how the data is still polluted at that last level. The abstract syntax tree and the PS script analyzer are the two ones I want to focus on here. If you take a PowerShell command, in PowerShell 2, you could use the .NET language parser to tokenize it, to say, in this command, this is your parentheses, this is a format operator, this is a string, et cetera. But with the abstract syntax tree, you get all that information, but you actually get its relationship. Now, this is really, really cool. One way that you can actually explore the AST um, is through the, this AST Explorer, which is a nice little GUI tool that you can just throw commands in there and kind of graphically explore. Um, but how can we use AST? One thing we can do is we can use it in Rickroll, because AST conveniently is in the name Rick Astley. All right? That, unfortunately, doesn't help you find evil. It just kind of makes new friends or enemies, depending on how the person received it. But we could also use the AST to, uh, to, to basically extract features, to say, tell me something about this PowerShell command or script. And this is some research that Lee Holmes and I worked on last year, where we basically assembled a, a corpus of uh, 408,000 publicly available PowerShell scripts from GitHub, TechNet, PoshCode, PowerShell Gallery, et cetera. Um, and then we labeled uh, portions of those scripts as obfuscated or not obfuscated. And then we basically used the AST to be able to, ex to lift and extract features, over 5,000 features from all of these um, input PowerShell scripts um, to then use it for detection purposes. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in this case, let's say that we use this as our download string obfuscation. Well, maybe as a defender, I would say, well, how many, in, in any given member, how many of the characters should be alphanumeric versus special characters? So here's just a little one-liner in PowerShell. In this case, almost half of the characters in this example are special characters. That's really weird in a member, right? That shouldn't be the case. But I shouldn't be trying to figure out, well, how much is too much, right? If we have this huge corpus of scripts, we can use data science techniques to basically let it decide how important is the count of special characters or the ratio, or maybe the ratio of uppercase to lowercase. And all these kinds of things are what we did and pull out of every single PowerShell script and command as features to say, is this obfuscated or is it not? And what that looks like in the end result is, in this case, we're pointing it to a directory of event log files. We're saying, take these event log files, reassemble PowerShell scripts out of the script block logs, the 4104s, and then pipe that into this measure RVO obfuscation function and store that in res. And as you can see here, it's going through these scripts and it's extracting 5,000 features. It's measuring them and saying, are you obfuscated or are you not, based on the learning uh, model that we built. And then as you can see, uh, we have the full contents of the scripts that it's labeled as malicious or as obfuscated. So in this case, this is one of those uh, white space um, white space only payloads. This is the second stage. This is actually what that white space only uh, resolves to, and script lock logging um, captures that. And then also in the data, we have all 5,000 features um, and all the values associated with that, as well as things like how much time did it take to extract those features, how much time did it take to measure, um, all that fun stuff. So if you're interested in that, then uh, Lee and I published a blog post on this, um, or you can watch us ramble on about this, or just check out the source code for yourself, um, or just uh, on, if you open up PowerShell and just do install-module, revoke-obfuscation, then you'll pull it from the PowerShell gallery and use it, be up and running in like 20 seconds. So attackers could also use the AST. 
Uh, Ryan Cobb is a consultant out in Texas who's done some really interesting work. He released this tool called PS Amzi at DerbyCon last year, a conference in Kentucky. I mean, basically, he used the AST and, and paired it with, so Amzi is the anti-malware scan interface. It's Microsoft's interface to say, hey, any registered AV vendors, you're welcome to interface with this and actually get, get visibility into all this awesome script lock logging for PowerShell and this additional visibility into a lot of other scripting languages to actually make in-memory, uh, have in-memory visibility to make block, no block decisions on whether something is malicious or not. So what he found was, okay, well before we as attackers could just obfuscate everything with all these tools and no one detected us. But now with this like science-y kind of stuff, it's actually really easy to detect super obfuscated stuff. So his thought process was, I can actually use uh, the AST and say, okay, registered AV vendor, you say invoke Mimi Katz is, is malicious. I'm gonna obfuscate it. Okay, will you still say it's obfuscated? Okay, well, Maybe I'll take the plain text version and let me, let me traverse the tree and hand you every piece of the tree and say, do you think this part of the script is obfuscated? No? Okay, that's clean. I don't have to obfuscate any of that. But you say this one is obfuscated. Okay, let me find what pieces of the script are obfuscated. Okay, it's just this one chunk here and one chunk here. Then he just obfuscates just those two chunks. So he's used the AST to basically systematically, minimally obfuscate PowerShell scripts based on signatures for an AV vendor. That's really cool. So, and he actually demonstrated uh, on stage a minimally obfuscated script that bypassed our revoke obfuscation uh, uh, framework. That was really cool. A really neat way to use the AST. So that got me thinking, how can we use the AST to detect minimal obfuscation? Using purely signature-based approach for an entire PowerShell script, you can bypass that so many different ways. Do we still do it? Better believe we do, because we still get value out of that. If we use revoke obfuscation or something like that, then we can detect obfuscated scripts, but what about people who are really fine-tuning and minimally obfuscating? Well, the AST will let us write signatures, not on the whole script, but we can drill down on very specific components of any PowerShell script or command. So in this case, um, this, is a, uh, this is basically using PS Script Analyzer as a framework that lets you write AST-based rules, um, and most people in the PowerShell world will use it to basically do syntax checking and stuff like that, but you can actually use it for security. So I'm basically saying, Take any PowerShell script and give me its abstract syntax tree, and then pull out all of the member expressions, all those download strings, and if any of them contain a tick mark, return as true and say, this has tick usage, this is suspicious. And on top of that, why don't we say, how many non-alphanumeric characters would we expect to see in methods, or in members, sorry. Um, and so with this corpus of almost half a million scripts, I have all this data I can play with and be like, well, let me see how common this is. And actually, there are some cases in which these trims and trim starts and stuff like that are used for. But basically, um, with, with this talk, uh, I've released these just six kind of starter detection rules, and, uh, and they're as script analyzer rules, so you can just run invoke script analyzer and it will run all these. But then I wrote this wrapper function to basically, this wrapper module makes it easier to kind of visualize what these rules are and how they're hitting. So what do I mean by that? Well, in this huge corpus of uh, obfuscated scripts, uh, we have ones that are obfuscated with invoke obfuscation, um, invoke cradle crafter, ISC steroids, a few different ones. And as we're running it, you can see it's showing, hey, here's the number of times this, uh, this element was in, this member was in your script. Here's the rule that it was uh, matched on. Um, and I think it's number 22, I think, is using the special characters only. And so it's going to have like hundreds of examples of variables, um, of actually uh, methods that are variables that are just special characters, like those right there. 500 samples of those, really crazy. And then if you go through just the clean samples, then it just shows clean. But it's basically kind of a way to say, okay, what kinds of rules, like for Invoke Cradle Crafter, the kinds of rules that we're hitting are ones that we're looking for really long member values. Like that's not normal. The average member value is like 22 characters. Why are you over 100? That's weird. So again, it, it, it's, it's allowing you to write signature-like things, but very fine-tuned focused on certain elements of the language. And I think that's really cool. And this is a way that we can detect this minimally obfuscated stuff, just by saying, let's try to define what normal is for members, and then look for anything that deviates from that, or what normal is for strings or commands or array sizes or things of that nature. Anything you can dream of with the AST, you can plug into that kind of detection. All right, enough of PowerShell. Command obfuscation. What can you possibly do with this? Well, defining the problem, 
You can obfuscate command.exe's arguments to evade rigid detections. And the tools we're going to use are Pester, which is another PowerShell framework for unit testing, um, as well as comp the, the concept of building a custom fuzzer, which I alluded to earlier. So uh, attackers are already doing all cool kinds of obfuscation. I obsess over this every day. Um, FIN 7, FIN 8, and APT32 do some really cool stuff. FIN 7 and 32 continually vie for first place in my heart of favorite obfuscators. They do some really tasteful stuff. Um, so to enumerate the problem space, um, or to, to create better detections, I wanted to see what, what's all possible here. And what got me started down this path was last June, um, uh, we basically discovered FIN7 testing some payloads, um, have some JavaScript obfuscation here. Instead of eval, they have this nice ASCII conversion from 101. But these two boxes in red here, this is dumped from a, a malicious link file. This really had me confused. What's going on here? Well, they're setting this WScript command into this environment variable x. And then at the end, they're echoing that into command. OK, that makes sense. Command is doing this stuff, and then it's launching a child process of command and echoing the contents in. But what I didn't get was they had these garbage delimiters. They had these at signs put in WScript and JScript. And this doesn't work when you run it. It didn't make any sense. But what you'll notice is at the end, when they echo that x, they actually create space after the variable name, and then they insert this syntax, which is amazing. It's a string replacement syntax native to command.exe that says replace the string, in this case, it's just the at sign, replace that with whatever's on the right side of the equal sign, which in this case is nothing. So in memory, it's saying take the variable x, remove all the at signs, and then that's your value now. This is really cool. When I saw this, I was like, Crap, what finesse. How awesome is that? This, this can evade static detections looking for common WScript strings in this example, but it removes it in memory. And I had no idea command.exe was capable of this. So basically, I spent the next nine months researching it uh, and obsessing over it and being like, what else can you do with command.exe? Um, and just last month, I released a, a white paper on this. If you have trouble sleeping, it's 36 pages, and it will put you to sleep unless you're crazy about obfuscation. Um, also released this tool called Invoke Obfuscation. Why? Why in the world did I do this? Well, for me, when it comes to obfuscation, it gets so deep that I can't keep all of the pieces in my head to know what's possible. And I know I'm going to miss things. So basically, as I discover uh, a possibility, like with that uh, string replacement, the best way for me to track that is to code it. If I can write that law or that rule as code, then I can get it out of my brain and know my code knows this now, and it will produce this for me at the click of a button. Heck, it'll produce a 1,000 of these at the click of a button. And as you start to build all these little discoveries into this tool, that's how it starts to mush all this stuff together. And as long as you're checking that it's still producing valid output, then your tool will start to find things you never thought about and find these really weird fringe cases that, as a defender, is awesome because it's finding the things I wouldn't have thought about doing, except that I built it to do that. So what you can do with this tool is you can take any arbitrary input to command, and you can add layer upon layer upon layer of obfuscation to get something that looks like that. So I suffer from FOMO, except for me. It's a fear of missing obfuscation, because I love it. And I love learning how other people are obfuscating. So with invoked obfuscation, this I built as a custom fuzzing framework, and also to automate my detection. Um, the, the, the ability to kind of have to build a corpus, because the, the stuff basically we'd not seen it used in the wild. So how do you build a corpus of things that don't even exist yet? Well, you build a tool to make it, and then you build that corpus yourself. And so I use Pester to basically say, anytime I found a new capability, uh, I'd write Pester test to basically say, make sure this doesn't break functionality. And it would, it, whenever I'd introduce something that did, Pester would say, hey, here's exactly where you broke this. You need to go into the framework and fix that. Um, and also, Pester can say, hey, are you detecting um, this kind of obfuscation? But the obfuscation was so many layers deep, I needed something more. So similar to the uh, last example, I created a wrapper, invoke DOS test harness, which wraps around these detections. And this is actually what I've done with all of my obfuscation frameworks, is I've done this kind of stuff behind the scenes. But with invoke DOS obfuscation, this is the first time I actually released, built like a legit test harness and released it so other people could benefit from it. Um, so here's the animated ASCII art from invoke DOS obfuscation. We'll just do just a, a quick, uh, simple demo of that. 
Um, but again, you can input any uh, arbitrary uh, command. So in this case, we'll just do an echo testing dosification. Um, we'll go straight to the payload. Um, there's four main like uh, in payload encoding um, options, and so we'll go with fin coding or fin seven style encoding. Um, we'll just choose the, the option three, which is the highest level, kind of. We'll get to that in a second, and it produces something like that. We'll copy that to the clipboard, throw it into a command prompt, and as you can see, it works. <laughs> Fun, right? So as defenders, this is what you want to do, though. You want to say invoke pester and say, OK, this is checking to make sure all the stuff you built still works and it's still producing valid code. And it will show some kind of basic uh, detection of did your rules detect this obfuscated thing. But the real thing you want to do is run invoke DOS test harness. And what this will do, um, and, and the, the version I released contains the exact commands that I use for all of my testing, exact commands. Um, and it will basically go through and generate obfuscated versions. Um, and I'll pause this for a second. In the tool, you basically get to choose between one, two, and three for like low, medium, high. That's choosing like a profile. There's like over 20 different knobs you can adjust for every single one of these functions. And it's kind of choosing a set, slightly randomized profile. But when you run invoke DOS test harness, it randomly chooses every single time all 20 of those flips, just like a, like a kid in an elevator, and it just flips all of them. So that when you actually run the test harness, you get a much richer obfuscation range than you ever would as an attacker using the tool interactively. So again, I tried to make the tool more user friendly for defenders than attackers because that's who I made it for. Um, and hopefully, this test harness helps with that. But basically, as it's generating payloads, you'll notice there's this uh, detection function. And this is the only difference in what I released. I didn't release my full rule set because my company spent a lot of money for me to spend nine months building that rule set. But the concept is the same. You basically put in a rule. In this case, it's just a regex. And say, let me say what this rule is looking for, and then add the regex in. And I'll fast forward just a second. And when it's done generating all these payloads, what it's going to do is it will execute the command locally just to say, I want to make sure this thing actually runs and that it's producing the correct output. And then it's going to check the detection rules and say, did this payload match on anything? And as you can see, it, several of these matched on a lot of them. But I removed a couple of my rules so that, hey, these two didn't match on anything. Now, why is this important? Well, this is important because when I run a couple thousand commands when I go to bed and I wake up and see a few that I missed, my tool just helped me find a false negative that I, I, I thought I had covered, but I didn't. So then I get to look at it and be like, OK, what about this evaded my detection? Was it the new thing I added last night, this new, this new capability? And then you can see some of these rules, some of these commands actually had over 10 different hits. Awesome. I like detecting stuff over 10 different ways. But some of them only had one or two. That means an attacker only has to change those two pieces to evade. So I really want multiple hits on all of these uh, detections, or on all of these uh, samples. So that's how I use the test harness. And that's the concept I really do apply to all of the obfuscation stuff I do. The very last one is framework fuzzing. So uh, there's people will add obfuscation to frameworks, uh, publicly available frameworks. And the tools we have here are called Control-C and Control-V to copy source code, because that's really nice. And then the for loop of any sort you're choosing to basically say, let me generate a lot of this thing and see what the results kind of look like. Why did we do this? Well, because developing a custom fuzzer takes a lot of time. It took me nine months to do that dosification stuff, and now the community can benefit from it with zero hours of effort. Um, but there's a lot of tools out there that you don't have to actually build any custom stuff. And so no, just so no tool developers would think I'm picking on them, I'm picking on my own tool. I said, invoke obfuscation does that crazy IEX stuff, right? So let me go to the source code of this invoke obfuscation project. Lines 873 through 888 contain these several lines that are basically, for every loop, it adds six randomly generated um, payload options for obfuscated IEX. I'm going to run this 10 times, which means we're going to get 10 times six. We're going to get 60 uh, samples. I'm then going to sort and unique them. And then just output, here's how many samples we created, and here's how many samples were unique. And this is just kind of generating uh, just the sample data set. So with 60, uh, we got 39. Let's increase it to 100. So with 600, we get 56. Let's increase it more and see if we get more than 56. I'm kind of enumerating this problem space so I can get the complete list of what's possible with this exact code. All right, so 56 seems to be the limit we're hitting there. And one thing I can do is say, let me just remove white space, because I know that's going to be randomly added in and see if that reduces our, our uh, data set. And when we do, we'll see it goes from 56 down to 28. Perfect. So it's stored in this unique syntaxes. So here's all the different syntaxes of IEX that this source code will produce. 
Now, I'm going to jump over and uh, basically apply the same, uh, the same idea that the test harness was, which let me just have an array of regexes to look at this and say, would I detect any of these payloads or any of these syntaxes? And then kind of output just the detection rate. So if we run it right now, with the regex being detection regex goes here, surprisingly, we catch none of it. Makes sense, right? We caught zero. So let's look at some of this and kind of scroll through and see, okay, what are some patterns we see? All right, well, I see some uh, variables that are being added. So let's just go with this first one, PS home. The numbers are kind of different. Sometimes it's one character, two characters. Um, but let's just go with it. So in this case, we're using regex, so we want to make sure we escape our characters, escape the dollar sign, the brackets. Um, instead of trying to find all the exact characters, maybe an attacker is going to actually go in and change some of those. So let me just use digits. One to two, go through, do some more escaping. And then when we run this, we'll see that detection rate go from zero up to eight. Eight of 28 we detected. Awesome. Let me go back and add in the potential white space uh, in between the brackets on either side of the plus sign um, and make sure that I didn't mess that up. And we'll run it again, and hopefully we'll still get those eight detections. So we add the white space in our rule, run again, eight detections. Perfect. All right. I don't see any more PS home. Let's go and look. It looks like we're doing a very similar thing with the shell ID. So maybe we'll just tackle that next. Um, in this case, you could put it all in one regex. I like to kind of have it separated out just to kind of think a little more clearly. But we'll just change PS home to shell ID and run that. We're going to go from eight detections up to 10 detections. Perfect. And I just keep popping off the queue and say, all right, what do I detect next? Again, can an attacker go and change the source code? Absolutely. How many people do that? Not all of them. Most don't. And here's a way you can just very simply enumerate. Find the code, enumerate to create your corpus, your data set, and then start to apply this logic to say, would I detect this? And here's just a couple sample rules um, that I built to say, all right, this, this, if you had these rules looking, it would detect every single instance of in, uh, obfuscated IEX produced by the public version of Invoke Obfuscation. That's pretty easy, right? That's awesome. And this is just looking at public code and just running it and looking at the data that comes out and then systematically tackling it. All right, key takeaways. I know that was a lot. Offensive research for detection development. There is some components that are reactive. When Casey tweets something, then you need to go look at it, and maybe you need new detections for it. But we can actually be very proactive. We can go out and say, there's this code that exists that I've never seen an attacker use before, but they very well could. So let me take that code, let me put it in a for loop and see what it generates, and let me write some detections for it. Um, just as, uh, as Tom was saying earlier, you know, looking at this DDE stuff, let's create a Yara rule and search virus total and see if we see any hits. Like, looking for things we've never seen before is like the most exciting part of my day. Besides making coffee, for my team and I, this is the most exciting part of my day when it comes to work. It's really fun. And we as defenders actually have an active role in not only detecting attacker activity, but also in a weird way kind of shaping it. Like, when it, when it comes to obfuscation, attackers are enticed in a lot of scenarios to use obfuscation because it'll evade a lot of things. But they've basically taken this huge, wide range of, let's say, PowerShell syntax they could be using, and they funnel it all down into this really ugly, disgusting like funnel of obfuscation. But we basically just reduced what they could be doing to this. Now, what if we got really good at detecting this at a lot of different angles? And we're actually shaping and encouraging attacker activity. The fact that attackers, that good attackers love using stuff that Casey Smith uh, tweets, that's awesome. That's shaping attacker activity. We should be looking for that. Those are wins for us. That dog thinks so. Where do we start? Somewhere. You don't detect everything right at once. And we always miss stuff. Like, that, that's a given. We can't detect every single thing under the sun, but we detect what we can and we continually improve. And we do it piece by piece. And, and, and this, this point is, may seem odd, but automate testing to preserve brain cycles. Pester testing saved brain cycles for me because instead of looking at a result and, say, and thinking just, just for a quick second to be like, is that right? Did this detection match? Okay, yeah, it did. Let me run it again. Is this right? Did it match? Okay, yeah, it did. That's stealing creative brain cycles from me. If I can put that in a test, in a unit test, and automate it, I never have to think about that again 
unless it comes up in bright red and said, hey, this didn't match, you missed this. And this is what allows me to not have to look at thousands and thousands of payloads and see, did it, I detect it, but just run a test and go to bed or go for a run and then come back and be like, did I miss anything? No, awesome. Or hey, I missed one out of a thousand. Sweet, let me look at that one. It, like, it, it seems simple and like maybe like over, overlooked, but it really makes a huge difference. I'm always thinking of ways I can preserve brain cycles to have the creative energy to come up with detections. And finally, uh, we should be sharing our successes, our failures, our methods, our toolings, et cetera. And I really hope that's obvious in, in the obfuscation tools that I write because I, I'm trying to share that research so other people don't have to go and stumble through all of that development, but that they can benefit from it right away. So in summary, detection development, it's an iterative art and a science. And people do it differently. We all have different tools, and that's awesome. And we shouldn't be mad about tool differences. We should learn from one another and see what works better in some scenarios and all improve together. DevSec principles empower more effective detection R&D. It definitely has for me. There's a lot of awesome and sexy PowerShell tooling that makes this really doable for me. I'm a big PowerShell guru, but uh, you don't have to use PowerShell. And then again, automate point in time thinking to free up those creative brain cycles. Um, the, the last points I'll say is it's important to have data. Um, if you can't collect public data of the thing you're trying to detect, then copy that code and generate it. Or if it's something, some, some crazy obfuscation thing that doesn't exist yet, build a thing to do that and then create the data. And finally, these techniques are tool and language agnostic. I know I've been kind of focusing on the PowerShell component. That's just what I like. But you can use any tool to generate that data. And also the detections, we just use regexes, but maybe that doesn't work for you. But you can put that logic in an IOC or a YAR rule or a Splunk query or a carbon black filter, all these different things. It's just providing an avenue to explore the concepts that you can then translate into whatever tools you have at your disposal. So here's some of the references of some of the frameworks and stuff. All, all of the modules and the demo scripts that I, that I did uh, are in this DevSec defense um, on my GitHub. And that reference is here on this next slide. Um, again, this is my Twitter, uh, GitHub, blog. Um, I just want to say I'm, again, just super honored to be here. Last year, the first edition was awesome. I'm honored to be here for the second edition. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's awesome to, ha to have you here, uh, and Daniel, again, so thank you. Any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. It could be about time. coffee too, if you want. Okay, I guess not. I, I think last year the very first question was, "How much coffee do you drink?" Because <laughs> I was a bit was. hyper last year. So yeah, awesome. Well, thank you again. Okay, I really appreciate thank it. you.